The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up! Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or younger, according to the time when he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. And there he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. seated please today's worship extends the season of Christmas but that's not the case everywhere uh, this last week I was up in Minnesota visiting my folks and Naomi and I had to run to Walmart for a little bit this was like three days after Christmas and when I went in the aisles they were busy taking everything down all the Christmas stuff and I said what are you doing with all the Christmas stuff and she said didn't you know Christmas is over? I said, no, it's not. It's not. There are 12 days of Christmas. And she says, well, not for us. We're getting busy to put up Valentine stuff. I didn't convince her one bit she should wait the 12 days. And so ample proof we have all over the place of our culture's short-lived treatment of this thing we call the 12 days of Christmas. And for me, it bears an eerie similarity to the stark reception that Jesus and his family received immediately following his birth. Today's scripture account of Herod's atrocities, and there's no other word for it but that, exposes us to the harsh winter winds of reality. And it is a reality that we know all too well. You see, Bethlehem is not only the place of the divine incarnation, it is also the home of the region of this immense human brutality which preceded and followed the birth of Jesus. Christmas awes us with the miracle of Jesus' birth, and yet so often we are quick to fail to remember the utter cruelty that was also experienced thereafter. If Jesus reflects the incarnate God Herod certainly reflects incarnate evil. As we hear this text, perhaps you, like I, am reminded of the scenes, the countless scenes of refugees today, fleeing hunger and violence in their own world. 
And as we know, the current upheaval and displacement of helpless people in Syria and surrounding countries is but the latest in a long succession of political and economic turmoil in that region of the world today. The Herods of this age are alive and well. And on the big stage of life, their days in power may be relatively short-lived, but nonetheless, they do their best to wreak havoc and destruction and death upon anyone who would threaten them. You see, this is how it was for Herod in Jesus' day. And from the wise men, from his own priests and scholars, he had a group of people he listened to. And he knew from them that the child that the wise men had searched out was very possibly the realization of the long-held hopes and dreams of the Israelites, the Jews. For hundreds of years, they had longed for a Messiah, a Savior. And now, lo and behold, in Herod's own lifetime, this longing might just be fulfilled. Instead of responding with wonder and joy, as the shepherds and the magi and so many did, Herod reacted with typical selfishness and deceit. Instead of seeing this, as others did, as a moment of grace and redemption for the people, he saw it as a threat to his control over each of them. And of course, this had to be eradicated. But we know that Herod's plan failed miserably, not because Jesus had a better army than Herod or, or because he had better intelligence than Herod. Rather, Herod's plan failed utterly because those to whom the baby Jesus was entrusted and born listened to God's word and obeyed it. And so the good news for us today on this second Sunday of Christmas is that here we have another profound image of God's kingdom, one that is readily available to each of us. Not a story of a kingdom long gone, but a story of a kingdom which reigns today. We hear the story of a family where the Word of God is at the very center, not only of their decisions, but of their lives, their being. I want to recap everything they've gone through up to this point, because it really helps to appreciate their decisions. First of all, they went through this unexpected pregnancy. We can only begin to imagine the turmoil, both, both privately and together, that they went through. And then there was the threat of divorce. Should Joseph divorce Mary or not? And then there is, consequently, this birth in a stable of all places, not to mention the joy and the thrill of all that being followed up by this crazed ruler who is determined to put that same child to death. Now these are problems. You know, if you and I think we have problems in our lives, and we certainly do have lots of problems, these folks really have problems. And this was just the beginning. Of all the ways they could have just thrown in the towel at any one of those junctures and said, this is enough, this is too much, I'm not the one, I'm on the way out, they made the hard decision to stay the course. They heard and believed the word of God. And then they lived it. Their obedient faith turned this unexpected pregnancy, lo and behold, into a revelation of God's will. Imagine that. It turned the threat of divorce into this renewed bond of trust between them. And it turned the birth in a stable, lo and behold, into a refuge for the poor. And it turned this death threat today into, well, I guess you might call it an extended cross-country vacation. But that was still a problem. But they faced that problem just as they faced every other problem. And it began by simply trusting God as they trusted each other. We hear later on in the Gospel that when others died, Herod and so forth, they were allowed to return. They were told to go back to Israel, but then when they saw that, that Herod's son was still there, they made their way to Nazareth. Again, a fulfillment of Scripture. And we see that there they would be received and loved and cared for by family and friends. It would be the right beginning for them. The Apostle Paul, as we know, wrote extensively in the New Testament. In fact, his books, his writings, take up about two-thirds of the New Testament. And he spoke about many things 
just an outstanding writer, a great theologian. But in the end, he sums up our pursuits in life along these lines. He says the things we should live for, and I'm going to say them slowly so you think about them, because there's a list here. Compassion. You know how important compassion is when others have compassion on you. Kindness. In a world where people are so unkind, we know how important this is. Humility. The ability to lower yourself in other, before others instead of propping yourself up. Gentleness. Not being the loudest one in the room, the most forceful, but being gentle. Patience. Waiting upon God. Forgiveness. Knowing how important it is that we forgive as we have been forgiven. Love, Paul says. The greatest of these is love. Peace. The ability to reconcile with one another on the heels of love. Gratitude. Turning to God appropriately out of thanksgiving for all the blessings in life. He goes on and on, but those are the main Christian values. Paul said that it was not easy for him, with a thorn in his own flesh, all his trials and struggles, to model those every single day. He wrestled with them. He struggled with them, as do we. And we face that same challenge as Paul, the author of these, these great verses, that of taking these Christian values and then intentionally determining how we're going to live them out in genuine, consistent manner. But you see, it's so difficult to do that. Wouldn't you agree, when we feel threatened to choose compassion and kindness and humility and so forth? When we are threatened, whether by violence or drugs or crime or terrorism or war or retribution or whatever it is, all of what Paul writes about might seem like simply a weak romantic notion. And yet these Christ-like values have enabled the church, Christ's church, to outlast every single threat since he emerged on the scene 2,000 years ago. These words are not last resorts thrust upon us when we have no other choice. Rather, these are the first option, and not really an option at all. They are the first choice, I would say, when we have to face those difficult, deliberate choices in the face of violence and revenge. These are the kind of choices, you see, that faced Mary and Joseph and Jesus as he grew up. And so today's story is not just some kind of continuation of the exciting ventures of Jesus, you know, as he was growing up as a child. That's not what this is about. This story, like all of these biblical records and accounts, have survived. They have survived and they have made it into the canon, the Word of God, for one reason. Because they point to the ongoing mission of the Son of God. That's it. We see that Jesus was raised in a family that trusted God in all things, moving Jesus then to do the same. And I simply want to give credit to Mary and Joseph at this point for doing what must have been very difficult, to be parents to the Son of God. Can you imagine that? We might think that Jesus just knew what to do because he was the Son of God. But remember, not only was he fully divine, he was fully human. And the parents that he had, Mary and Joseph, brought up Jesus in such a way that the man he became came, was a reflection of the parents they were. Jesus turned to God, consulted God's word, because that was what Mary and Joseph did, day in and day out. They were holy parents to Jesus, who did the remarkable work of raising this child the way God wanted Jesus to be raised, to be obedient to faith and to God's word first. And because they and Jesus were faithful, death was not the end for Jesus. 
nor will it be for us. Here's the takeaway from today's sermon. No matter what hardships there are in your life, no matter what difficult choices you face, no matter what life throws in front of you, you too are called to be faithful, knowing, trusting, believing absolutely that God will be faithful to you. Let us pray. Lord, on this second Sunday of Christmas, we are made aware again of the world in which we live, a world that is populated by rulers and dictators, by people who are bent on evil and destruction and death of others. Lord, we pray for a change of heart throughout the world. We pray for our enemies. We pray for all those, Lord, who would kill us, who would see us gone because we confess our faith in you. Lord, on this day, like Paul writes, may our first choice be to turn to you in humility, in gentleness, and in kindness. May we return the love to others that you have bestowed upon us. May our choices reflect first your will, your truth, and your light. Bless us to walk the way of Jesus, of Mary, and of Joseph. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.